Okay, so we've covered rotation, we covered moment of inertia, and we covered the concept of rolling. Okay, so here I have a, a problem. I have a hoop, a disc, and a sphere. So hoop is like a ring. Okay, take a ring off your finger. Okay, or it could be like an empty can with, with no ends on it. Okay, so I have a, a hoop, which is a ring, thin ring. I have a disc. Okay, so a disc could be like um, a roll of quarters, okay, or a quarter, okay. So um, it's solid, okay, so a flat disc or a cylinder, they're the same. And this one's a solid sphere. Okay, and I put them um, at a starting line, and I, know, I want to know which one finishes first. Now, all of these are made to have the same mass and the same radius, okay. Okay, so I want to figure out which one's first, which one's second, which one's third, okay. So... The one that's going to win is the one that's going to be going the fastest at the bottom. Now, we mean the fastest. We mean if there's a little finish line here, it's which one's going to have the biggest speed of the center of mass. So let's calculate to see which one has a larger speed of the center of mass and also a larger translational kinetic energy. Okay, so let's take a look. After running some trials, Students are going to see that the shape is going to influence the acceleration. So some objects will be faster than others. Okay. We saw previously that for an object that rolls, okay, so for something that rolls, that rolling is a linear combination of pure rotation about the center of mass, that's the spinning part, and pure translation of the center of mass that's moving, let's say, left to right. So the total kinetic energy of something that rolls, okay, is that portion, that's the kinetic energy due to rotation about the center of mass, and that's the translational kinetic energy of the center of mass. So now when something rolls, when we say kinetic energy, there's two parts. Okay, so I wanna look at the hoop. Okay, that's the ring that goes down the incline. Okay, well, the rotational kinetic energy, okay, is one half the moment inertia times the angular speed squared, right? Now, there's a table in the book and the table in the book has a list of the moment inertias for different shapes. And so since you can think of moment inertia, we first looked at it like that, okay? You go out to each point mass and multiply from the axis rotation out to where that mass is. For a ring, okay, there's a ring. Okay, if there's the axis of rotation, okay, all of the mass is as far away as you can get, okay? So that would make the moment inertia largest compared to a disk or a sphere, where the disk has some of its mass um, closer in, and also the sphere, okay, has some of its mass closer to the axis of rotation. Whereas the hoop, okay, the ring, has all of its mass as far away as you can get from the axis of rotation. So its moment inertia, okay, has the form mr squared, Okay, because remember, moment inertia has the form mass times the length squared, mass times the length squared, okay? And what length is associated with a circle? The radius, so there's your mass times length squared, mr squared, okay? And for a hoop, the moment inertia has the coefficient of one. So the moment inertia for the hoop about its center of mass on that table is mr squared. So that's why I put right there was mr squared. Okay, and then I add it, okay, the translational kinetic energy of the center of mass. Okay, now I want to be able to compare these two terms. Okay, I want to be able to look at those two terms. Okay, so what I did is I said, okay, we saw for rolling that the speed of the center of mass, this is the condition for rolling, the speed of the center of mass is r omega. So right here where I have r omega, okay, that's v squared. So I put in v center of mass squared. Okay. So now if I look at this, the total kinetic energy, I have one half mv center of mass squared plus one half mv center of mass squared. So the total kinetic energy of a rolling ring is mv center of mass squared. Okay. So here the kinetic energy is split 50 50. 50% 50 is, is wrapped up into rotation, 50% is wrapped up into translation. Okay. Now, if I do it for another shape, if I do it for a disc, okay, and again, you can think of a disc as like a penny, okay, okay like a platter, all right, and again, it doesn't matter if it's a penny or a roll of pennies, it's still a disc shape. So if I want to calculate the total kinetic energy, okay, for a rolling disc, 
is I have to include first the rotational kinetic energy about the center of mass plus the translational kinetic energy of the center of mass. So the first one here, okay, when I put in the moment inertia about the center of mass for the disk, okay, I look on the table and it kind of looks like this one here for the hoop, okay, but as it turns out, instead of having a one, there's a one, okay, it turns out there's a half, okay? So think of taking some of this mass from the hoop, okay, and moving it now closer in to the center of mass because the disc is solid, whereas the hoop, okay, is empty, all right? So with a hoop, all the mass is as far out as you can get from the axle rotation. With the disc, you have a lot of mass close to the axle rotation, okay? So there's that half. That, that's shown in the table. So now when I multiply this out, okay, here again, I want to be able to compare these two terms. So the condition for rolling is the speed of the center mass is r omega. So this r omega is v squared, okay, and I have a half times a half, which gives me a quarter. So now when I add these two terms, the total kinetic energy of a rolling disk is three quarters mv center of mass squared, okay. And it's broken up. The, the kinetic energy is no longer 50-50, okay? So the rotational kinetic energy is one quarter, this is for the disk, is one quarter out of the total three quarters. So it's one quarter out of the total three quarters, okay? And I get a third, all right? So that's where that 33% came from and the 67%, right? That's a third and that's two-thirds, okay? So a third of the energy is wrapped up in rotation, two-thirds is wrapped up into translation. Okay, now for a solid sphere, okay? Solid sphere is now three-dimensional, okay? Instead of a flat disc, okay, or a long cylinder, it's more, well, it's spherical. So instead of having, remember the moment inertia always has this form, this is for point particles, Okay. It has something, the term is a mass times a distance squared. Mass times a distance squared. Well, what distance associated with something round? The radius. So there's my mr squared. This coefficient, okay, it was a 1 for a hoop. Right, right there, there was a 1 for a hoop. It was a half for a disc okay, from the table we had. But the table in the book has for the solid sphere... That coefficient is two-fifths, okay? So now when I multiply this out, the twos cancel. I have a fifth, and if I add a fifth plus a half, I get two-sevenths. Okay, that's a weird number, okay? And then what I did is I took this one-fifth. I took one-fifth. So I, I want to look at the rotational kinetic energy of the solid sphere, rolling solid sphere. So the rotational kinetic energy, that part, is one-fifth out of the total seven tenths, okay? So when I do the algebra, the 10 flips on top, and I wind up with two sevenths, okay? So the 10 would be on top, 10 would cancel the five, so I have two sevenths, and two sevenths is about 0.29, okay? So 29% of the energy is wrapped up in rotation, the rest of it, about 71%, is wrapped up into translation. Okay, so how is that going to help us answer which of these things wins at the, at the bottom? In other words, which one's going the fastest? Well, again, we said the one that's going the fastest has the biggest translational kinetic energy. So what I did is I took all these results from the hoop, disc, and sphere, and I made a table. Okay, hoop, disc, and sphere. So the moment inertia came from the table in the book. Okay, that coefficient is 1. Remember, remember with the hoop? We said all the mass is as far away as you can get from the axis rotation. So that's why that coefficient is larger compared to all the other ones. Okay. For the disk, there is a one half in the table, and for a solid sphere, it was two fifths. Okay. And then I looked at these fractions. There's one there, there's one there. Okay. So for the hoop, the kinetic energy was split 50-50. Okay. For the disk is one third, two thirds, and then for the solid sphere, that was my two sevenths and five sevenths or 29 percent 71 percent okay so using this table which one wins 
Okay. Well, the sphere wins because most of its energy, 71%, is wrapped up in the translation, okay, or translational motion. And translational motion means from point to point in a straight line, okay? So the smallest percent, 29% compared to 33 and 50, the smallest percent of the kinetic energy is wrapped into rotation. So when I let these things go at the top, okay, the sphere, since it has more of its mass constant or uh, located closer to the axis rotation, a greater percent of its motion is wrapped up into translation, which is straight line motion. So the sphere starts to make its way down. Okay, the hoop. Okay, the hoop has more of its energy, 50% compared to 33 and 29. The hoop has 50% of its energy wrapped up into just trying to turn, just trying to rotate. Whereas the sphere only has 29% of its energy wrapped up in a rotation. Okay, so compared to the hoop, when I let the or compared to the sphere, when I let these go, the hoop is still trying to rotate. Okay, much like that demo we talked about when you try to rotate that object versus that object, right? Like these are the water bottles on your backpack. Okay, this object has a big moment inertia. Okay, this object has a small moment inertia. This is easier to rotate. So this is more acting like the hoop. All of the mass is further out. And this is more acting like the solid sphere. Okay, that's easier to turn. So the sphere is gonna start to rotate quicker and make its way down. So that's why the sphere comes in first, the disc comes in second, and the hoop comes in last. Okay, and I'll show you a video on that. After running some trials, Students are going to see that the shape is going to influence the acceleration. So some objects will be faster than others. Okay, so the video shows that the sphere wins. Okay, that was first. And the hoop comes in last. Okay, so it depends on how the mass is distributed about the axis of rotation. So since the hoop has all of its mass as far, as far out as you can get, okay, Remind you of when the water bottles are far away and you're trying to, to rotate that. That has a large moment inertia. It offers a big resistance to rotate. The hoop is still trying to turn while the solid sphere makes its way downhill. Okay. So now I want to look at, let's say I have a race between a solid marble okay, and a bowling ball. So I have a small solid sphere and a large solid sphere. Okay. We'll forget about the holes in the bowling ball. Okay. Now, so both of these are the same shape. They're both spheres. Okay, the marble has small mass, small radius, bowling ball, large mass, large radius. Okay, I want to know now which one wins. Okay, well again, the winner is going to have the biggest speed at the bottom. So let's use conservation, conservation of energy to figure out which one has a bigger speed at the bottom. Okay, so here's the picture. Okay, so I let this thing go from rest and I want to find V center of mass at the bottom. Okay. So I, I used U here for potential energy, but remember, some books use a U for potential energy, okay? Some books use PE for potential energy, some books use U, but for now, I'll, I'll just think of it like that, right? That's your potential energy. Okay, so here's where the, the solid sphere, either one of them, reaches the bottom of the track, okay? And I want to find the speed right there, all right? So... I'm going to conserve energy, right? So we had an energy expression said that the only way the energy can change is if there's non-conservative forces that do work, okay? So um, there, are, there is no kinetic friction. It doesn't slide. It rolls, okay? So there is no energy being dissipated by friction, okay? So there's no energy loss to friction. No other non-conservative forces do work, okay? Or no non-conservative forces do work. And so energy is conserved. So I pick my reference point for potential energy to be at the center of mass when the ball hits the uh, the bottom of the incline. So I have initial potential, initial kinetic, final potential, final kinetic. Okay. So initial energy is all potential. So mg times the height. Okay. So that's my height h. Okay. All right. My final potential. Oh, my, my, and my initial kinetic zero because it's not moving. Okay. Final potential is zero, that's my reference point. But my final kinetic, we just saw there's two types of kinetic energy for rolling object. You have a rotational kinetic energy about the center of mass, plus the translational kinetic energy of the center of mass, okay? So for rotation, I put in the rotational kinetic energy, and for translational, I did the same, OK? 
Okay. Now I want to be able to find V center of mass. Okay. So we know for rolling, V center of mass is R omega. That's a condition for rolling. So I solved this for omega and I took this omega and I put it right there. So I have omega squared. Okay. Right there. That's my omega squared. Okay. Now I just multiply both sides by two, right? Cause we multiply both sides by two. Those twos would cancel. You'd have two GH, two GH, and I divide it by M. Okay, the algebra is a little bit messy. Okay, I divide it by M, M, M. So the M's would cancel. Well, those M's would cancel. Okay, and I factor out the V squared. There's a V squared there, a V squared there. So I'd have this would be a one. There's my one, and then I would have my moment inertia i, okay, for the, the solid sphere, and an m r squared on the bottom, okay? So you just look look through this and go through the algebra. It's a little messy, okay, but it's not that bad, okay? Okay, so whether I'm doing the, the small sphere or the large sphere, the bowling ball or the marble, g is the same, the height is the same, okay? Now, even though the bowling ball is larger, okay, the center of each one, center of mass of each one, both fall through the same height, okay? And then the only thing that's different is the moment of inertia. Okay, so first, first glance at this, this looks like that the speed of the center of mass depends on one over the square root of the moment of inertia. So it would seem that whichever one has a smaller number here, smaller moment of inertia, would have a bigger speed, okay? So what I can do is I can put in the moment of inertia for the marble, put in the moment of inertia for the bowling ball, and see what we end up. So I'm going to calculate V center of mass for the bowling ball using this expression. So I have 2GH, okay? I have 1 plus, now the moment inertia for the bowling ball, okay? That's our 2 fifths mass of the bowling ball, radius of the bowling ball squared over MR squared, okay? If I do this for the little marble, okay? Still have 2GH, 1 plus, okay? This term here, whoops, for the marble, right there, okay? So that's my moment inertia on the bottom, so 2 fifths, but the moment inertia is little m, little r squared, okay? But this term here, okay, that's the mass and the radius squared for the thing that's rolling, that's the marble, little m, little r squared, okay? So if you look at this, those mr squareds cancel, those mr squared cancel, and these, velo these speeds of the center of mass are the same. Okay, so it doesn't matter that one is large and one is small. What matters is that um, what's the mass distribution. So back here on this step, when I looked at this, this expression, and I said, oh, the speed of the center of mass looks like it's, a, it's proportional to one over the square, square root of the moment inertia, okay? That's not actually correct. So if I rewrite this term or this expression back down here, okay, so V center of mass, I'm gonna write that, 2GH, one plus I over MR squared, okay? And remember the moment inertia always has this form. It's for something round in those uh, tables. It's some constant times mr squared, okay? So for the hoop, it was a one. For the disc, it was a half. For the solid sphere, it was a two-fifths, okay? So if I take this and put it right there, that says V center of mass, okay? I've got two GH on the top. I have one plus, and I'll put in what I is, okay? Remember, in this chapter, you can say what I is, right? You can't say I is in English class, but you can in, in physics class. Okay, so I put in what I is, and I is k m r squared divided by m r squared, and those cancel. Okay, so all it depends on, okay, and I'll rewrite this one more time, see if I can squeeze it in here. There's my square root. I have 2 g h, and the bottom I have 1 plus k, and that k Okay, depends on the shape. Okay, so for the hoop, okay, and then I have the sphere. Okay, 
the hoop, that K was a 1, and the sphere was a 2 fifths, right, which is 0.4. Okay, so if I have a small number here, whoops, if I have a small number here, then that means, because it's in the denominator, then V will be big. So whichever shape has the smallest moment inertia, okay, that'd be the sphere for the ones we're doing, then that says the sphere would have the greatest speed at the bottom, okay? So th that's another reason why in the first uh, race that the, the sphere won, but looking back between the marble, okay, and the bowling ball, oops, bowling ball, okay, we saw that, that the, whoops, we saw that the MR squared canceled for the bowling ball and the little MR squared canceled for the marble, okay? So all that was left was the coefficient, right, that two-fifths based on the mass distribution, right? And that two-fifths is that constant K. So that says that as long as you're rolling two solid spheres, doesn't matter one's big and one's small, there'll always be a tie between a sphere. Okay, now if you did, let's say, a hoop, that's a hoop, okay, or some books called a ring, that's fine, okay, versus a disc, okay, and a disc is the same thing as a cylinder, okay, that would be like a platter or something like that, solid platter, okay, well the moment inertia for the hoop, whoops, moment inertia for the hoop is mr squared, Okay, moment inertia about the center of mass, moment inertia about the center of mass for the disc is one half mr squared. So here k is one, here k is one half, okay, and we're looking at that term right there, okay. So the speed, actually v center of mass, is really proportional to one over the square root of that factor k. So whichever one has the smaller um, constant, in front of the MR squared, okay, that's the one that has a larger speed. So that says that regardless of the size, okay, remember these dimensions cancel out. So regardless of the size, the disc, which has the smallest K, one half is smaller than one, a disc will always beat a hoop. And the one with the greater rotational inertia will lose the race because it will have a greater resistance to a change in its state of rotational motion. Now right now the state of rotational motion of both objects is zero. They're not rotating. Once I remove the piece of wood, uh, one of them is going to rotate more quickly. Let's see which one that is. Okay, and remember K for a sphere, solid sphere, K for a solid sphere, solid, Okay, is two fifths. Whoops, two fifths, which is 0.4. Okay, and 0.4 is less than that, and it's less than that. So that means you'd have a smaller number in the bottom here, which has the biggest speed. So between a hoop and a disc and a sphere, a solid sphere will always win. Okay, so it's kind of like when you play rock, paper, and scissors. You always throw out rock because rock always wins. Okay, same as same as this. Sphere will always beat a hoop and a disc.